My name is Dawn Dixon, and I'm going to talk to you about the importance of micro angels to entrepreneurs. So I'm going to give you all a chance to roll in. And while we're waiting, it would be really awesome if you could drop in the chat where you're joining from. I would love to see what part of the country um, you all are in. So if you would please drop in the chat. Let me know you're here. Let me know you're watching. I love to engage and um, get feedback. You know, this is so much different than an in-person conference when I can see your faces and know that you're in agreement or that you're that you're feeling what I'm saying. So I really appreciate if you would use the chat and let me know, um, you know, if something resonates with you, make a comment, um, let me know, you know, what you're thinking. And then at the end, I will make sure that I answer all of the questions that you have. Um, I am really passionate about this, this topic, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to speak about it here today. I want to really thank the Centrifuge team and the PNG Signal for having me. It's such an important conversation that we're going to have today and um, something that I feel like we all should learn. These are things that we don't learn about in school, and a lot of us don't find out about these things until we're well into adulthood. So, um, okay, I see Charlotte, North Carolina. Hey, Desmond, I see Cincinnati in the building. So I'm going to jump in. I definitely want to respect everyone's time. Hey, Columbus, Ohio, uh, one of our popcorn investors are here. So I'm going to jump in. And as I said, I'm going to answer all the questions that you have at the end. And um, yeah, in the meantime, just drop, you know, definitely drop things in the chat. Um, I see you guys are rolling in. And like I said, when you join us, just let us know where you're joining from. I love to see uh, Ohio in the building. So I'm going to um, step out of the chat and I'm going to make my screen a full screen and just talk you all through some things today. So again, um, my name is Dawn Dixon and I'm a serial entrepreneur. Uh, my current company that I'm focused on is called Popcom. And I'm here to talk to you about how all startups can gain access to capital and how everyone, every single one of us can be an angel investor. So before we get started, shameless, shameless plug, please follow me on social media and engage with me, network with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you like what I'm talking about, please share on Twitter, tag the event, I'll retweet, and let's just keep it going, keep it Engage. So just so you know who I am, if you've never heard of me, um, I just put this here so you know that I know a little bit about what I'm talking about, probably a lot about what I'm talking about. But I've been featured in a lot of media um, and just many shows and about um, my accomplishments and entrepreneurship over the past 20 years. So you're in good hands today. And like I said, this is a topic that I'm super passionate about. Just to give you a little background on me. I'm born and raised in Columbus, Ohio, went to The Ohio State University, and I studied journalism and marketing. So first, before tech, I am a marketer and a writer. And then I went to DeVry University after I graduated from Ohio State to get some tech skills. And, you know, at this time, this was in the early 2000s, I actually graduated in 2000 from Ohio State, and I seen that technology was starting to really grow and how people were engaging with personal computers. And so I wanted to learn about tech. That's how I got my start. I had my very first job here in Columbus at Nationwide Insurance, which is a, the place that everybody wanted to work. And as you see my face, I look very excited because, you know, I got out of college and got this, you know, dream job. Um, and not long after getting this job, uh, I realized that I really wasn't built for corporate America. I mean, I think, you know, we were groomed for it. I was groomed for it um, my whole life and I was definitely a great student, but I got the entrepreneur bug. So 2001, I made the leap, the free fall into entrepreneurship. So I'm approaching my 20th year. I'm like in my 20th year being an entrepreneur right now. And, um, you know, it's, it's always feels like a free fall. You know, it never does change that feeling of, of uncertainty but it's definitely very exhilarating and, and I, I love being an entrepreneur and my first business was in tech. So I just put this quote here um, just to kind of start the, the discussion. 
But this talk today is not just for entrepreneurs, it's for everyone. It's for if you are an entrepreneur, if you are interested in being an entrepreneur, or if you're interested in being an investor, or just curious about you know, the whole entrepreneurship uh, landscape, this is what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to keep it as brief as possible so we can talk. So an entrepreneur tends to bite off a little more than he can chew, hoping he'll quickly learn how to chew it. And that really is a great quote to sum up what we have to do. And I want to start by just sharing with you, as an entrepreneur, the types of ways that I've raised money so that you can understand my history and my background and where and what led me to really digging deep into um, angel investment. So my first um, company, 2001, was called the Urban Star, and we bootstrapped, you know, friends and family. And then we made money from, from sales, from online ads and, and email marketing. And the pros of bootstrapping, um, you're not in debt. Um, this is meaning you're using your own money or friends and family investment in sales. Um, your cash flow positive quickly, you know, because you're all, you're growing organically from uh, sales and you keep control of your company, which is something that's so important and, and just starting to be talked about in the, in the uh, entrepreneurship community about maintaining control um, of your equity and of your business. The cons are, you often liquidate your personal assets. You know, you drain your savings. Um, the cash flow could be on the negative side. You know, we you a lot of times you don't grow as fast as you want, and you could run out of money faster. A lot of times we overestimate what we're able to do as far as growth, and we we just don't have enough money. I think every entrepreneur can relate to running out of money at some point in time. So a shorter runway, which runway means how much money that you have in the bank. And if you're not raising a ton of money, you don't have a lot of money in the bank to work with, or if you're only just using your own money. And then you grow slower. You know, you, you don't have the millions of dollars to really accelerate growth like you would in some other ways of raising money. And I always say your first angel investor should be you. And it really shows you asking in the game and that you believe in your, your business. And, and I always tell entrepreneurs, if you're not willing to invest in yourself, why should anyone else do that? There's also pitch competitions. I won't go deep into this, but I did win a significant amount of money in pitch competitions. And I'm just showing you my steps, the stages that I took on my journey of fundraising. I've raised money in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, I've come into my sweet spot after many years of trying. So free money, most of the time, they generally don't take equity and it's immediate cash infusion into your business. I understand that it's very difficult for some people to get in front of rooms and communicate and pitch and compete. But I always encourage people to just try because, you know, why pass, pass up some free money if you can get it? I also participated in three accelerator programs. I put fs6.com there for those of you who are interested in finding out more of how can you find pitch competitions, accelerators, and incubator programs near you and globally. I participated in New Me Accelerator. And now that New Me Accelerator is now based in Cincinnati, Ohio, and was acquired by two of my favorite people in the world. Candice and Brian Burkeen. I also participated in Techstars in Los Angeles, Brink Accelerator in Hong Kong, and Plug and Play in Japan. Um, some of them are investors and some of them don't. Accelerators invest in businesses and they take equity and incubators, give you resources and help and put you in front of customers. So I've done that. I've also raised a million dollars from venture capitalists and accredited angel investors. So the pros, uh, large cash infusion, which what we all need is some cash, right? You can scale a lot quicker with venture capital money because it's more money and because the fees, the VCs often bring expertise or they should bring expertise in a network to help you grow. The cons, this is a quote that I like to refer to. The golden rule is he who has the gold makes the rules. So it's a lot of times, most of the time it's their way and things are, you know, the terms could be sharky. I use the word sharky because of shark tank. So sharky. Um, it's a longer process, you know, definitely relationship building. Um, you have to wait for the funds to be dispersing capital. Um, it's just a journey. It's not, it's not a quick thing. Um, you can do that in a form of equity or debt uh, where they can, um, you know, give you a convertible note or safe. And then you can lose control of your company. It's very easy to lose um, controlling shares or controlling votes. And so it's just a con it's just one of the cons of, of venture capital investment, even though I was able to do it successfully. And I'm very grateful for that experience. Um, it 
it wasn't my favorite way to raise money. But you can learn more about uh, VCs and, and dig into it on Gust and FS6.com. So this leads me to what we're here to talk about today. And as I said, I raised a significant amount of capital from accredited angel investment. And so I'm going to break down what that really means. But first, I want to share the pros and cons. So I love angel investors. They're just people. They feel more like people. Of course, VCs are people. They're lovely people and everybody's people. But the angels feel more like people because it often is heart led. You know, they do it because they like you. They understand the industry really well. Um, they're passionate about helping entrepreneurs. I mean, it's their own personal money that they're investing. Um, they're pretty flexible. Um, um, and, and excuse me, they often, if you pick the right angel investors, they can help you and give you knowledge and connections because it's great to get angel investors who actually know your industry. And then you maintain your control. It's very rare that an angel asks for a board seat or tries to exercise any type of control over your business. They really just want to see you win. The cons can be they do write smaller checks. You know, we talked about VC a moment ago and they'll write million, two million, five million, ten million, twenty million, etc. And typically angels start around 5,000 and, and can go up. My largest angel investor invested 90,000 from one single accredited angel. It could be a possible strain on relationships. Um, just because sometimes if you, which I've experienced with uh, friends being accredited angels and it's sticky when you get money from friends because sometimes they, you know, they don't understand the whole process. So it could be a possible strain, but if you do a good job of, you know, updating your investors and communicating, no problem. They definitely get to take equity, which isn't a complete con, but for those founders who are so attached to, I don't want to give up equity. This is something that you do give up. And then it takes time. Um, you're really building a true relationship and they have to trust you. So I want to talk about um, just the history of angel investing and just investing in general. So after 1929 stock market crash, the Securities Act of 1933 was passed to protect investors losing money. And so what it basically did was restricted the access to high risk investments only to accredited investors. So they're like, oh my gosh, so many people lost their money. Um, we're not going to let people take these high risks anymore because, you know, they don't really know what they're doing and they could, they could lose everything. So we're going to put a law in place so that only accredited investors can invest in high risk opportunities, specifically startups. So the SEC defines accredited investors to mean you have a net worth of $1 million. You make $200,000 as an individual, $300,000 as a couple for the past two years. Financial institutions like banks, insurance companies, brokers, and trusts are also regarded as accredited investors. So what this means is that accredited investors are the wealthy people. About only 10% of Americans are accredited investors. I googled top 10 investors. And I had 10 pictures of white men there. So this is the makeup of who is able to invest in high risk investments. And that's because accredited investors are expected and assumed to be very smart, knowledgeable, financially savvy. And they don't need the government to protect them and keep their money safe because they're smart. They just know everything. However, 90 percent of us, we're not smart enough to make investment decisions for ourselves. You know, we need the government to tell us what we can invest in. We need the government to protect us against, you know, making an investment of our money and potentially losing it. And this is because the belief is that people with lower incomes were just not educated enough to make a decision. You know, they it, it was uncertain waters. Where would these low in, lower income under two hundred thousand dollar a year people? How would they know what's a good thing to invest in? This has seemed so ridiculous to me when I first learned about accredited versus non-accredited because, you know, I was like, how dare the government tell people what they can do with their money? I mean, I do understand, of course, that you want to protect people from being taken advantage of. And, and this happens all the time, scams and schemes. However, I feel that with the, these laws, what happens is um, it keeps the wealthy wealthy and wealthier and wealthier because they are the only ones that can get into these early stage deals. The top 10% of individuals in the U.S. own more than 70% of the nation's wealth, and they're the only ones able to get really get more. That's over twice the amount owned by 
the 90% on the bottom. I mean, can you imagine a scale where 10% is top and 90% is considered bottom? That doesn't even sit right with me and it and actually never did. So I did a quick search too, like how do people even get rich? How did these people even become a millionaire? And here I put the, the clip there is that most of the millionaires assets were investments. The first thing they said was investments. So that leads me to say, if you can't participate in higher risk investments that yield higher returns, yes, there's a risk, but a higher return, how can you create wealth? How can we create wealth? How can we ever level the playing field truly? If we don't even get a chance to get into the game because we are considered not smart enough to get into the game, how? So the SEC made it impossible for non-wealthy people to get in on early stage investments until now. And this is what I'm here to talk about is the Jobs Act. And it's called Jumpstart Our Business Startups. It was passed on April 5th, 2012 by the Obama administration. And what it did was allow non-accredited investors to invest in higher risk investments, specifically startups, because they realized our business startups in America need more capital. We're constantly hearing about the buried entry for venture capital. We're constantly hearing about how you have to be in certain geographic locations to get access to capital. We're constantly hearing about businesses being denied access to loans because of whatever reason, biases or income or whatever reasons. So now this Jobs Act says you can go get money from non-accredited investors. You can go raise money from people. But not just that. that just, it wasn't just for entrepreneurs. It was also for investors saying, now investors, you have opportunity to create wealth. Now entrepreneurs, you have an opportunity to get money from anyone. So this is what I call micro angel investors. And essentially that is crowdfunding. And the pros are anyone can invest. Anyone can invest. Not just the 10%, anyone. You can raise money globally. So you're not limited to just the United States, just your city, just your state. Anywhere you can reach on the internet, you can raise money from. Typically, you raise money on your terms. Yes, there's a due diligence process, so you can't throw out anything crazy. And of course, there's um, they they do make sure that you know you're compliant. Everything you say is true. You're not scamming. But at the end of the day, it's pretty much your terms. You can do a rev share or equity, so you have flexibility in what you what you give up. Which typically you don't have flexibility in what you give up. And then. Other types of fundraising, not not equity, but fund uh, equity crowdfunding. Excuse me, crowdfunding like on uh, Indiegogo and Kickstarter. You can pre-sell your product, so you can raise money from the public to build your product, even before you build the product. This particular talk is really focused on the equity side of things, but I like to always mention the other side of things that involve products. But for me, this is about equity. So what I've have here are some logos of some of the top platforms. There's a lot of platforms out there, but Seed Invest, WeFunder, Fundable, Circle Up, Republic, and Start Engine are just a few of the platforms that you can go to to raise capital for your business and go to to find startups to invest in and companies. And it's not just tech. You know, people will say, is it only tech companies? I have seen everything you can imagine from fitness, uh, drinks, sports drinks, juice bars, um, cryptocurrency types of things, my company, Popcom. Um, it's not just tech. It's all types of businesses. And the cons are, it does have high platform fees. That's how they make their money. The platforms take a percentage of your raise. Um, due diligence can be brutal. Um, I understand because we're going all the way back again in 1933. The laws put in place by the, by the government to protect investors. So it's not just wild wild west fair game they're going to do very intense due diligence on your company to make sure that you can raise money from the public that you're credible and trustworthy also bad actor checks also deep financial reviews and, and everything that typically you would have to do when you're raising money from institutional capital however the upside is your investor pool is just way bigger um i put a con could be 
you know, revenue sharing may not be a great way to grow. A lot of times we'll think, okay, I'm going to take this money now and I'll make it back in six months and I'll share revenue. And if you don't hit those goals, the pressure of meeting those revenue share requirements exist. Um, it can be time consuming. Uh, it can be time consuming to build a community of investors. Um, nothing is easy. No, I've done, I've raised money every way possible, but government grants and none of them were easy, but it's all worth it. Um, the network strength. I mean, depending on what platform you raise on, there are literally thousands of investors already out there actively searching for deals all the time. And on the investor side, you get to connect with other people, other like-minded investors and learn about early stage deals and comment and engage with these other investors. So you have a community of your, of your own as well. I will say from my experience that crowdfunding is such, such a new instrument. The Jobs Act passed 2012 and it really didn't come into effect in 2015, 16. And so even today, this very day, today, many venture capital investors, institutional investors do not understand this instrument. They are smart enough to understand it, of course, but they didn't take the time because it wasn't threatening to them. It wasn't a thing. And I, they don't, they think that it makes your cap table messy, which it does not. It actually is one light item on your cap table. However, limitations do exist. I want to make sure to communicate this for those of you who, who are here who are actually investors. Um, if you have an annual income under $100,000, you can only invest 5% up to 5% of your income. So when you go into the platforms to make an investment, they're gonna ask you all these qualifying questions to make sure that you're not exceeding um, you know, your ability to invest, which again, I'm not a fan of this, but it's another measure the government put in place to make sure you don't lose it all. Um, even though I personally feel that that's not their place, um, I can understand it to a degree, but I also feel like it's another measure to keep the 90% out of the 10% because you can't take a huge, huge risk. Say you make $100,000 a year, you live well below your means and you have $50,000 of disposable income that you want to invest. You're not allowed to. And we all know the more you invest, it's a high risk, but it's a higher return. So this is something that I think we definitely need to encourage legislators to improve. But despite the limitations, it's, it's quickly growing and, you know, investors, institutional organizations have to get familiar. Um, they're, they're going to have to come to terms with it and start to work with companies like mine who have crowdfunded more because it's going to reach $350 trillion raised by 2025. Um, so for founders, you now have an alternative to venture capital funding and an alternative to maxing out your savings and alternative to everything else that I spoke of before. You can reduce your dilution. You don't have to give up so much so soon, especially before you have product market fit and start to really show real revenue. And you can scale at your own pace. There's no pressure to raise a ton of money and then rapidly scale, rapidly find product market fit and don't really get an opportunity to experiment and, and explore before you really double down and start to start to burn cash. For investors, you can invest in a business. You know, many of us will go to the stock market, go to NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange. Now we're using Robinhood. Now we're using Stash and many other things. And we're investing in publicly traded companies. But now you can invest in a privately held early stage company where you have a higher opportunity to reap the rewards of that. Um, you can sell your, your equity shares. You have a 12 month holding period. After that, you can you can sell them. And then the upside, the positive side, you can recover initial investments with profit. You can keep the shares and make massive profits at a successful IPO. I mean, I don't know if you all seen when, when Uber did their IPO. Was it Uber? Yes. And they showed a, a screenshot that went around social media about how much people made, how much their early stage investors made from Uber. Now keep in mind, it's a journey. This is a 10 year journey from start to IPO. And that's typically a time you should think about, you know, early stage investment as a long-term hold investment. But I've seen somewhere where an investor put in $5,000 into Uber early stage, walked away with 25 million. I mean, can you imagine the lives that were changed by a $5,000 investment turning into $25 million? However, 
And I felt like, hey, nobody called me and asked me, do I have $5,000? Because I have $5,000 I could have invested in Uber. I had that ready. Nobody called me because number one, I wasn't accredited. And number two, I didn't have those networks to get access to those early stage deals. We're intentionally left out of these deals. Now you can get into these deals. I have seen phenomenal companies come across these platforms that we would never ever have opportunity to invest in ever. We're talking about 1933, we've been shut out of investing. So I really do deeply believe that Reg CF, that the Jobs Act is the future of entrepreneurship and the future of wealth creation in this country. And it starts with us really educating ourselves about what we can do. And that no matter how much money you make and no matter where you work, you can invest. Many of the companies have um, minimums. So sometimes it'll be a minimum investment of $100. My crowdfunding raise minimum investment was $250. But you can now get in and have an opportunity to create wealth for yourself. Now, I want to say this, and this is important, just an extra added reminder to startups that want to raise money through crowdfunding, please have your stuff together. Please ignore my, there we go. Have your stuff together and due diligence is critical or you're going to get denied. You can get denied. I want to be clear that you don't just go put your company on a platform to crowdfund. You have to go through due diligence. You can get denied. So here's some things that you have to have together and to learn more about that, go to this resource here, dealroom.net. just want to share some of my sunshine, as I say, in 2019, I became the first female founder, not just black female founder, but first female founder to raise over a million dollars um, in a Reg CF crowdfunding campaign. Um, I did it in the form of secure token offering. And in 2020, just July 11th, uh, last week, I closed my second um, oversubscribed equity crowdfunding campaign. Um, so I have a total of about 4,500 investors and I've, and I have raised $2.3 million through crowdfunding and I have about $350,000 on our wait list currently. So it was a huge success. And as you see, I'm, I'm a firm believer in this. And this week we had our first virtual investor summit on Hopin, what we're all talking on here today on Hopin. We hosted a hop-in conference, 850 investors and joined me, joined me and my team on hop-in to talk about um, the progress of the company. And it was one of the most amazing feelings I've ever felt to have so many engaged investors and supportive investors. And as we're telling them about what we're doing, they're talking about they're going to you know, use it at their jobs and support us. And they're sharing it with their friends and family. And just to have a community of people that rally behind you as a founder, it means so much. It, and, and our team really became energized after meeting with 850 investors. Um, it, it, it's unmatched. It's an unmatched feeling. So um, that's all that I have for my presentation because I really encourage you all to really dig deep into um, the Jobs Act, into investing, go to the platform, sign up, start looking around, um, and seeing how you can invest. And I'm now going to take some questions. Um, I'm going to go in here and take some questions. I'm so excited. And I'm actually going to turn this screen off. There, that's me. Okay. So, um, any questions that you have? We Funder offers great deals, especially for Central Fuse members. So, here's a... Here's a Wonder Fund offers a great deal for Centrifuge members. We have that there. Um, any more questions? When will you open up another opportunity to invest in Popcom? Great question, Kay. We are in the process of, um, there's so many laws around what I can say publicly under the SEC rules and regulations. It's a highly regulated thing. We are currently in the process of getting approval to raise another round. Uh, so it's coming. I don't know exactly when, but please stay tuned because it is coming. Uh, Jerry said the Investor Summit was definitely an experience in my first time using Hopin. Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing, amazing experience to be able to um, 
meet with investors and talk to them and just have a captive group of investors. What I what I believe and what I stand on is that creating a community is how you really grow. And we have 4,500 investors. My passion is creating micro angel investors around the world. My goal is to have 10,000 angel investors by the end of 2020. The power that we have, I mean, can you imagine if everyone is investing in companies? We, we literally in the next 20 years can shift the wealth uh, in this country. It's so possible and it's so reasonable. And, it, and if more early stage startups would take advantage of it, know about this as an option, um, it, can, it can really change lives. But it, does, it comes down to education and that's why it's so important for me to do this today. Can you explain more of your experience with the secure token offering? Sure, Kevin. So initially, let me rewind really quickly to give you some background on why I even wanted to do a secure token offering. I wanted to do an ICO, initial coin offering. This was in 2017. This is during the ICO boom when many companies were raising millions and millions of dollars through um, issuing, selling their token on a secondary private exchange and essentially going public through um, various exchanges. The government made this illegal in 2018 for companies in the United States to raise money this way as ICO because of the many scams and things that happened and what they call bad actors in the space. And they made it very critical to do KYC, which is Know Your Customer, and AML, which is anti-money laundering. And so in order to regulate this and keep companies from raising 30, 50, 100 million dollars in with no type of regulation, because in the ICO time, you had to write, all you did was write a white paper, publish it, and raise money. There was absolutely zero regulations, checks and balances, or due diligence in place. So the SEC stepped in and rolled this underneath the Jobs Act. And they put limitations on it. And they have the Reg CF, which you can raise a $1,070,000 um, in a 12-month time, or a Reg A+, plus, you can raise $50 million. So I did the token, so the secure token offering was my way of still doing a token offering but in a compliant way, according to SEC regulations around token sales. My thoughts were that uh, the government would approve and make legal an ATS exchange to allow people to trade tokens the way that we did on Poloniex and other exchanges back then. But the government has yet to approve an exchange, meaning token holders of privately held companies, they don't have a place to get liquidity. I believe that eventually this will be approved and happen. Uh, there are many people working behind the scenes to get this legislation approved. I recently spoke before um, Congress um, to talk about the benefits of blockchain technology, um, which is where tokens come from, to raise capital. And so a lot of us are working very diligently to um, really get this legislation approved where there'll be a time where you can buy tokens in a privately held company like mine and go online and trade those tokens. Um, we're a little bit ways from that. Um, can, can you speak to how to break through on these crowdfunding sites? Are there best marketing practices to garner interest from possible micro angel investors? That is an awesome question. Um, the first thing is really to vet the sites. There's many sites that you can raise capital on and all of the environments and different types of audiences. For example, I know that um, Republic requires you to generate five to ten thousand dollars a month in recurring revenue in order to raise on their platform. So there's many different things. So the first way to break through is just figure out what platform best aligns with the stage of your company and what type of um, marketing do they offer to you once you reach certain milestones. I raise money on Start Engine because I like the Start Engine team. I like that Start Engine is working actively for a secondary exchange to be approved by the SEC. I like that Start Engine has a large group of investors that are very, very active and in, in, in engage and invest in many things. And I also like that Start Engine will do some marketing for you once you reach certain milestones. The best marketing practice is you start them before you even crowdfund. Months out, when you realize you want to do a crowdfunding campaign, simultaneously with working on your due diligence, you should start working on your campaign strategy. You start building your audience and um, 
doing things like positioning, positioning yourself and your company to be a thought leader by putting out white papers, blogs, posts, media, podcasts, really just spreading the message about yourself and your business and get as much content as possible out about yourself and your business so that when you do prepare to do a crowdfunding campaign, you have this credibility and you didn't just pop up out of nowhere. So best marketing practices is come up with a strong campaign that includes thought leadership on your part as a CEO. Also, engage in your community. The first week of the crowdfunding campaign is critical to the success. They say something like, if you don't raise money in the first week, the, the likelihood of you really achieving your goals is very low. So with, to do that, you need to really be prepping your community and your supporter base well in advance. You can't say I'm about to raise money on crowdfunding, but what you can tell people is, you know, sign up for our email list to be part of future fundraising campaigns and get as many of those people as you can on a captive email list like a MailChimp or wherever you choose to do that. And that's what I did. I compiled a list of interested investors and supporters, and I was sending out for the past several years, I've been sending out monthly and quarterly updates, um, monthly updates to my investors and quarterly updates to my network. That way they're prepped and they know what I'm working on. So I encourage everyone to even do that. I mean, these best practices for crowdfunding happen off the site, off crowdfunding. It happens with the things that you do for your business. Being very engaged and active on social media is also very important. I encourage you to follow the 80-20 marketing rule. 80% talking about your industry, talking about... Um, messaging about what you do, why what you do is important, your customers, and then 20% actually directly selling your product or promoting your product. No one wants to see social media where it's constantly sales. So educate people. So we spend a lot of time educating people on social media and creating content on social media around our industry, automated retail tech, smart vending machines, facial detection, and everything that we work with to prepare people. So all of this was done beforehand. We also put together an extensive marketing strategy for our campaign that included Facebook ads. And we put we hired an agency to help with Facebook ads. And so you really need to approach this as a full-time job, fundraising is a full-time job, no matter how you raise the money. And definitely position yourself to have a lot of content out there. I mean, I've done hundreds of interviews on podcasts, probably almost a thousand at this point. Of, of podcasts and blogs and anyone that asked to interview me, I interviewed them. It's just more information, more content, more supporters. So you have your work cut out for you. I actually am working on an online course where I'm going to teach people how to do the strategy that we've done twice, because I do feel like we have it down to a science, but there are steps you take and that's, you know, most of those things are done well in advance of the launch of your campaign. Um, what are the preparatory work, marketing setup, et cetera, that you did prior to the crowdfunding campaign? That's basically what I'm what I was speaking on, um, writing thought leadership pieces, blogging, I'm on Medium, um, on LinkedIn. And I also took time months before the campaign to shoot videos about the product, product demos, meet the team, explaining, you know, the difference between the token and equity, explaining why we're raising money, what we're doing with the money, um, showing uh, any question people had, we made a video for it. I also did um, ask me anything session when the campaign launched to give people opportunity to talk and engage with me live on, um, you can do it on Instagram, Facebook, and I believe even YouTube has a platform that you can do that on. And I think even LinkedIn does, but it's so important to stay engaged. So the prep work was everything. I mean, I, I do realize that myself and some of the other founders who have raised over a million dollars in this way already had a very large following. However, I built this following over many years, but I also believe you don't have to have this following that I have in order to raise money in this way. It's all about your marketing campaign and people like myself and Angela Benton and, you know, others, um, we have successfully raised large crowdfunding campaigns which just created a pipeline for everyone else because now I have 4,500 people that invest. She has, you know, 2,000. Another founder has 2,000. We're talking about thousands of people that now have become angel investors that never invested before. So I would take time to really research the successful crowdfunding campaigns that have existed 
and find a way to target some of those investors. I mean, uh, it's a way to do it, definitely to target investors from different campaigns and attract those investors. Facebook ads were very effective for me. We um, we spent about $15,000 on Facebook advertisements that generated $350,000 in advertising. Um, 350,000 in investments for us. So it's a very, very effective way to reach targeted groups. But you also have to understand how to create those like audience campaigns and really monitor them. So I certainly recommend that you work with an agency that can help you and doesn't have limits on the amount you can spend. We try to do it by ourselves, And um, our Facebook account kept getting restricted because we're not a typical large advertiser and so working with an advertising agency is a way to get around those limitations and also um, the algorithms that exist um, you know for angel investors and people that are interested in investing again just go out looking on these platforms get to know these companies do your research and due diligence there's some amazing companies out there and i ask that everyone here watching this please share this message with your friends family peers colleagues about encouraging them to invest in in early stage companies i truly deeply believe and what i shared with you today the evidence proves that the way to create wealth generational wealth is through investing they also do inheritance but we all know that many of the people that are you know came to this country in the very early days they were inheriting things that they had an unfair advantage to even pass down and and hold on to so this is really a way to level the playing field it's going to take decades but we need to start today and, and all founders. Now you can finally allow your friends and family to invest in your business where you may not have been able to do that before because they may not have been accredited. Does anyone have any more questions? We're at, um, and thank you for the congratulations. Um, oh, here's more questions, great. Um, congratulations, thank you. The next question, can you speak to the startup scene in Columbus and your experience in being in a space outside of the larger tech markets? Um, the startup scene in Columbus is, is um, small. Um, I actually was a lot more engaged with the startup scene in Cincinnati than I was in Columbus. It's growing, um, but Columbus has a lot of more work to do in, in general for the investment community. and. I think a lot more should be done to rally everyday people to um, invest and support local startups through crowdfunding. I think there's not enough VC money in Columbus to fund our startups. And I think it's responsibility of the community to start funding our startups more. Can one invest in overseas startups through crowdfunding? What is your experience, what is your experience in this investing? So I have personally never invested in overseas and in, in companies through crowdfunding. I am sure that it's possible. However, I have investors from 15 countries in my company. So investors from other countries can invest here. I've never sought out investment in, in companies out of this country, but I encourage you to look into it if something that you're interested in. I do also know that many of these platforms do have, now that I'm thinking about it, do have companies from other places. So I encourage you to definitely look into this. But I've invested in three companies through crowdfunding so far. And like I said, I raised money twice this way. And I definitely plan on continuing to be an angel investor. Um, I agree the token offering and the trading of these tokens is a big part of the future. Great. Um, with, this, with these platforms, is the share value predetermined based on pre-valuation or does the share value change based on how many investments you receive? That's a great question. The value of your shares is based on the valuation of your company, which is preset, and the number of shares you have issued on your cap table. That is what equals the share price. So let me give you an example. Let's say the company's worth $100. Company's valued at $100. You have 100 shares issued. The founder has 20 shares. You're selling 80 shares, which is 80%. That means it's a dollar a share. That's it. Companies have different amounts of shares. The reason why my company is worth, my company valuation is 25 million and our share price is 55 cents is because we have 45 million shares issued on our cap table. And 
that just allows us to have a lot, lot more flexibility as we as we grow and want to raise more money without diluting down our investors too much because we've already issued these shares. That's what that means. So um, the share price is based on your actual company valuation. We're a, we're a C corporation. And so that's how things are handled in that type of corporation. Have you created a video and uploaded the same video to various social platforms to save time and money to educate at the same time you're creating a new video for every post for the campaign? So yes, on our YouTube page, we have multiple videos and we just keep them in our library. So every time something new comes up, I'll do a new video. But at this point, I have three Ask Me Anything sessions that basically cover everything. But I do encourage that you create new videos for every campaign because each video needs to speak to what you're doing with the money, why you're raising the money and what, you know, the, the status and strategy of the upcoming the, the disbursement of the funds. But for every question, you don't need new ones. Um, uh, you're welcome. I think I've answered all the questions that I see. Here's the last one. How do crowdfunding investors exit from their investment? That's a great question. And so there's a great article on republic.com called Startup Exit, Startup Liquidity. But basically, the way that you get your money back are essentially three ways. Um, a liquidity event, which is an IPO or acquisition. That's one way. Second way, if there is a secondary ATS exchange approved, which it will be one day, I don't know when, where you can actively go and trade your shares like they used to do with crypto, like altcoins. So eventually the SEC will approve this. That's maybe it'll happen before the, the company IPOs. And then you can go onto the platform and trade the tokens. The third way is after the 12 month holding period, you can show, sell your shares. The rules around what you can do to sell those shares depends on the rules that are set by that particular startup. For example, you may have to give the startup first right of refusal to buy the shares back, or you may have to only share those, sell those shares to accredited investors, but there are ways to get out to exit from your investment. Um, it's definitely a long hold, but if something were to happen and you needed to get out of it, those things do exist. Uh, thank you, Vaughn. Thank you for the congratulations. Yes, the Popcom team, we're moving full speed ahead. You know, uh, crowdfunding has certainly changed my life as a founder, allowed me to raise $2.3 million from my community. Also, as an investor, I am now an angel investor. I, I, I have been able to invest in a total of five companies, three of which are on crowdfunding. And so I feel empowered. I feel empowered for my future. For, for the generational wealth of my family. I feel very um, optimistic about this new legislation and what it means for communities that are underrepresented, you know, like, like people of color or people in a geographic location that don't have access to, to wealth and to wealthy individuals. Now you can cast your net wide. And so I, again, encourage you to please uh, consider uh, investing in startups, please consider becoming an angel investor. We need you. We need all of you. Every dollar counts, every $250 counts, every everything really matters. And so thank you so much for joining my session. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day at this phenomenal summit. Thank you again to Centrifuge. And if anyone wants to reach me, uh, you can definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn uh, and all the social networks that I am currently engaged with. Have a lovely rest of your day.